Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with co-host Walter Dial, who's tax partner at GRF CPAs and Advisors here in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building a sellable business and then uh, planning your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that's sellable and then exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. And the work that we do, at times we'll encounter a situation where it would be helpful for a business to, to reorganize in their operations, as well as maybe uh, their corporate structure. And in analyzing if indeed a reorg, a corporate reorg would make sense, the tax implications and potential tax pitfalls need to be thoroughly, thoroughly considered. And so we thought that that would be a good topic. And, and that is our topic today, tax implications of corporate reorgs. Uh, Walter's going to review some options with us, some tax traps, if you will, and best practices for reorganization. So, Walter, to kick us off, what do you, what would you say just to kick off the, co- the conversation? Well, Pat, you know, I think the um, the impetus for this session, you and I have had a couple cases recently where it just seems like it has made sense for the corporation to restructure itself. We had one situation where there were actually two business entities and we were trying to figure out, you know, how to transfer the two to the next generation. And we looked at kind of reorganizing the corporate structure in that case. I've had a number of cases over the years um, where shareholders just don't get along. And oftentimes you can split the business up in such a way that one shareholder can take the part of the business he wants to run and the other one can take the part he wants to run. And you can do that in a tax-free way. Um, the other thing I think you know, we've been seeing recently is there's certain market sectors are really hot from an M&A perspective. And a lot of businesses, especially government contracting businesses and, and tech businesses kind of have different lines of business, even though they may not even really identify them as such. And what they're realizing is there are certain aspects of their business that are very valuable in the M&A market and others that aren't aren't so valuable. So in that situation, it can also be very beneficial to be able to split the operations up and market the one company as a standalone company. So we've kind of been dealing with a number of issues over the past few months where it, it just kind of got me thinking, hey, you know, I don't think we've ever talked about how to restructure a corporation um, on this podcast. And while it's a very technical and complicated uh, topic, I think we can at least cover some basics today. Yeah. So you, you've started to do this, but let's be even more clear. Um, just run through, it, it, down through some of the, the types of corporate reorganizations that we might be referring to. Okay. And, you know, everything is based on, when it comes to corporate reorgs, everything is based on the tax code. So the tax code identifies seven different types of reorganizations, and they're basically type A through type G. So type A is just your typical merger of corporations, where one corporation acquires the assets of another. Type B is where one corporation acquires the stock of another. Type C is where one corporation acquires the stock of another one and then liquidates the other one. Type D, which I think is where we're going to be spending most of our time today, is really is a corporate reorganization. And that and you've probably heard the terms spin off or split off or split up. Those are all type D reorganizations. And those are the ones that we've been using mostly in our practice um, recently. Type E is just a recapitalization. And we do use that also. Like, let's say, for instance, you have a corporation that is going to transfer or you have an owner who's going to transfer ownership to the next generation. He may want to, and all they have right now is just basic common, basic voting common stock. He may want to recapitalize the corporation before doing the transfer. And he may want to add non-voting stock. He may even want to add preferred stock. So that's just a recapitalization where you're not really doing anything with the business structure but you're changing the equity structure of the, of the corporation. Type F is um, really just kind of a 
an entity or name change. So you see that most normally when a corporation goes from one state to another, they just have to reorganize in the other state. So nothing's really changed. Um, you also see this where a corporation changes its name. There is an interesting um, use for this when it comes to the work we do. And it pops up, it actually pops up a lot. Um, and the IRS never really intended this, this uh, the F reorg to be used for this. But if you have an S corporation and you have a, like a, you, we usually see this when it's a, a private equity buyer involved. Private equity doesn't want to buy an S corp because as soon as they do, the S corp election is blown. So what they would prefer to do is buy an LLC. And with the F reorg, an S corp can actually turn itself into an LLC. So it's pretty cool. You can do that. And then um, the PE company can buy the LLC, which gives them some, some tax attributes and just makes the whole deal work, work better. So there are times when an F reorg comes into play for sure. And then the final is a uh, type G, which is just a reorganization as part of a bankruptcy plan. Yeah, so I think, so, you know, the one that we see yeah, the so most the one you right mentioned now is that type we're D. Gonna, we're going to focus on today is D and, and mention what it is again, and then maybe give uh, a situation or two that would be applicable to, to D. Okay. So type D is what we think of when we think about reorganizing a corporation. And within type D, there's three subsets. There's a split up, a split off, and a spin off. So Walter, Walter, before you go any further, how, are you, how would you define corporation in this sense? Is, are you defining corporation as um, C Corp or C Corp plus S Corp? You know, how are you using I, the term? Yeah, good question. It would be this, these would apply to a C or an S Corp, which brings up another point, which is why it's so nice to have LLCs. You don't need to go through all this stuff with an LLC. It's just a lot easier to uh, restructure an LLC that is a corporation. But of course, there's, you know, there's other good reasons why businesses are set up as C and S Corps. But yeah, this discussion is, is focused on C and S Corps. So, yeah, in situations. Yeah. So let's talk about a split up. So a split up is where you, you take a single corporation and you form multiple corporations. So let's say you have, you know, a great example is let's say you have a company um, that maybe it has kind of an undesirable company and a great company. So let's just say it has like a hazardous waste disposable business. So it has a lot of a lot of risk associated with that. There could even be, you know, some kind of negativity around it. And then you got this great, let's say it's a trucking business. So you might want to turn that into two separate businesses. You know, one reason would be you'd want to do it just to eliminate, just to kind of, you know, both businesses are somewhat risky. So you can minimize your risk by moving them into two separate corporations. And you, so you do that, you set up two separate corporations, you transfer the assets of the one business into, into one, the assets of the other line of business into the other. And you do that in exchange for the stock of the two you've set up. And then that stock is distributed to your current shareholders in exchange for their stock in the other company. So you basically end up, you've taken one company, turned it into two with the same ownership, but the Nice thing about the split up, the other way it can be used is you don't have to distribute the shares in the new companies pro rata. In, in other words, let's say you currently have a 50-50 ownership in the existing company. But let's use my example again. Say you have a, a waste disposal business and a trucking business. One of the people loves the waste disposal business. The other one loves the trucking business. And they're starting to butt heads about making decisions on things. This is a great, the split up is a great solution for kind of resolving that issue. So you can put the trucking business in one, the waste disposal business in the other, 
and you can distribute only the waste disposal business stock to the one shareholder who wants that business and the trucking stock to the other one. So in essence, you've separate, you've completely separated their ownership. Now they're really no longer working together. Um, so that's a, you know, that's one way, one place where we've used it before is where there's, where there, there's a problem with shareholders. Yeah. And again, what are the, what would be the motivations for that? Just to, if you could just mention those motivations again. So really the motivations in the split up are going to be some type of corporate discord where you want to split the company up so that the shareholders no longer have to work together. Or you may just be trying to transfer businesses that are, you know, like one may be more valuable than the other one, may be riskier, that type of thing. Yeah, there might be, it, 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 mentioning the M&A market, it might be a hot market for trucking companies. Yeah. Right? And so that could be a motivation too. It's just to spend right. all- Yeah. And if you're trying to sell that business, someone may say, gee, I'd love to have your trucking business, but you know, you I also don't want your waste disposal business. <laughs> I don't yeah, want to get involved in that. Your, your hazardous waste business. <laughs> right. Um. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's pretty much where we would see a split up. And it is, um, you know. Now, when, very, when that happens, help. okay, let's talk about the tax implications. Well, the whole idea of all these reorganizations is that they are tax free. So, you know, it's very unusual for shareholders of a C or an S corporation to be able to receive anything out of their stock or out of their company and not have either a corporate level or an individual level tax it. So these are all ways to achieve your goals in a tax-free manner. Now keep now I should have pointed out and I'll point this out now. There are three basic requirements for any tax-free reorg. And they are one is continuity of the business enterprise. So the idea being that the business is going to continue to be run in its historical nature. So even though, you know, you've in my first example, the split up, even though you've formed two corporations, they're going to continue to operate as they have historically, just, just on their own. So this, you know, this, the point, one of the um, implications of this is you can't just spin your business off and sell it the next day. So you have to be like everything else we talk about. You have to have time to plan this properly. There are different time frames for how long you have to hold the business. And interestingly, it's kind of tied to how far down the M&A road you are. If you haven't even started, they don't make you hold on to your business as long. I forget what it is. It's like six months. But if you've already started in negotiations, you have to wait like two years. So they don't, they don't want you just doing this to avoid tax. Yeah, so that's um, an important piece of information yeah. right there. Yeah. Uh, the second test is continuity of shareholders. So within the group, you have to maintain 80% of the same stock ownership as you had previously. So like in my example, you had two 50% owners. Um, now you have 200% owners. But as a group, you're, you still have 80% ownership. So th- in other words, this is not a way um, to necessarily bring in new shareholders. You can do it to a, a limited extent, but that, that's not the purpose here. And you can kind of see what the IRS is saying or Congress is saying, you know, they're okay with you doing this, but not to kind of finesse some way to change ownership dramatically. You know, not some type of disguise sale from one shareholder to another. And then the final, requirement is there has to be a business purpose for the reorganization. So you can't just do it because you're going to get better, a better tax treatment. Now, you know, there's lots of business purposes for doing this. So that it could be like we talked about one sector of your business is ripe for M&A. So you want to spin it off and take advantage of that in a couple of years. It could be a shareholder dispute. It could be one business is very risky and you don't want that tainting the other one. So yeah, it just seems to be a very broad category. Uh, are the, is there a list of, 
not business purposes that the uh, IRS has created? Well, there's been lots of private letter rulings in this area. Um, most of them are pretty positive because most people aren't asking for private letter rulings unless they're pretty sure they have good facts. But, you know, the one that doesn't work is, hey, I'm going to spin this off and sell it. The other thing that doesn't work is spinning off. Uh, we, I'm dealing with a situation right now where a guy's got an S Corp and for some <laughs> reason he's been, um, he's invested a lot within his S Corp. So now he has all these appreciated assets, which he wants to hold on to, but he wants to sell his business. So you run into problems because you can't spin off the appreciated assets because they're not, they're not a business. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good point. Let's, let's stop there for a second and make sure that listeners are clear on this. What, what are the types of assets you're talking about? Real estate and, and could it even be an investment portfolio? Of some yeah. Sort? In this case, it's a stock portfolio. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've just had to be careful, you know, as far as that goes, but so just, you know, keep in mind in order, you know, you're getting a tax free treatment. So there's going to be IRS requirements. That's why it's really important to make sure that you're aware of exactly what the requirements are and you've really spelled out how you're going to meet them. And you would use a tax attorney to, you know, draft all the agreements and everything else. Yeah. You know what? That's a good, uh, let's stop there for a second too. When would they use tax attorney versus CPA in, in, in this type of uh, transaction? So what we, you know, our normal procedure is we structure everything, go through the tax, how the tax ramifications are going to work and all that. And then they take it to the attorney for a second set of eyes to make sure, you know, it works the way we believe it'll work. And then the attorney does all the paperwork as far as the corporate documents and all that. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's really a team approach. Okay, what's next situation? So next situation would be a split off. And in a split off, you're basically, rather than forming two corporations, you're just forming one. And, you know, a good good example of that would be, where you might use that is, let's say you have a family business, which has two lines of business. Uh, Let's say a catering company and a flower shop. And you have two, two daughters involved in the business and the, and the mother's the owner. One daughter kind of runs the flower shop. One daughter kind of runs the catering. So the mother is not really ready to transfer the business to them completely, but they are currently minority shareholders in the one business. What she could do is set up one new business, transfer, for instance, the catering assets to that one, give the daughter who's involved in the catering business ownership of that one. And then in exchange for her ownership in the flower shop, then you would end up with the mother still being the majority majority owner of two different businesses, each girl a minority interest in only the business they're interested in. And eventually then the mother could transition all of her ownership to the daughter who's interested in that particular business. The goal here being, you know, the mother doesn't want to keep the corporate structure as it is with just the one business and the two lines, knowing that it's going to cause problems between her two daughters later on. Right, but how is this situation different from the first situation that we, we discussed? The difference in this one, and it's, you could do it either way. The difference in this one is you've only set up one sub as opposed to two. So it's really, it's really not necessarily different. It's just mechanically it's different. And that's, you know, that's the way the code defines them kind of on the mechanics of it. Is it, uh, would it be similar or how is it different than just setting up a DBA and doing business as? It's different because you really, at the end of the day, the goal here is to have the daughters owning businesses and not being, and not working together. Mm -hmm. 
That's the difference because there's yes. two entities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then the final one was the spin off. And the important thing about a spin off, and the reason you may not see them as much um, in the context of exit planning is with the first two, you were able to, I remember I mentioned you could redeem people's shares unequally so that you can end up with different ownership in the new companies. Mm -hmm. With a spin-off, you can't do that. So a spin-off is just the classic example. You have two guys who own a business, they get along great. And you can go even back to my first example. You know, one line is really risky, one line isn't. And it just makes business sense to split it. But, but they have no problem. So they're going to just continue to eat. They're going to own each company 50-50 when all is said and done. So that's kind of the most simple of them because um, you're really not changing anything other than just setting up another corporation. The other ones, you're going to probably change ownership as well. Yeah, and in, in any one of these situations, um, what... What are the decision points or factors in regard to what structure you actually use for the new entity, C Corp versus S Corp versus LLC? Yeah. <clears throat> so from, you know, I think from a tax perspective. Yeah. So, and I think it kind of gets back to what are you doing when you start your company? So, and it's, you know, it's unfortunately no one knows the future. So, the general rule is that most businesses start off as LLCs because they're just so flexible. You know, you can have any type of shareholder. You can have corporate shareholders. You can have individual shareholders. You can have trust shareholders, S corps, you know, you're limited pretty much only individual shareholders. Um, it's a flow through entity. So there's only one level of tax with a C corp. There's the potential for two levels of tax. If you've got a situation where you want to do a reorg, you don't have to worry about this tax-free stuff. With LLCs, it's automatically tax-free. You can distribute all the assets of an operating line of business to one partner. He takes them tax-free and moves on. So it's, you know, it's very, very simple. Um, having said that, in this, there are reasons why people will start with a C-Corp. So and, you know, we could do a session on this. And I think we've discussed it, this whole, this whole uh, qualified small business stock, Section 1202 stock, where if you're a C corporation and you've held your stock for five years, you could literally pay no tax when you sell your company. If you sell your C, your C corporation stock, there's limits, obviously, but it's like $10 million limit. I mean, you could literally pay no tax. So that's the big advantage of being a C-Corp. And then, of course, um, you know, the S-Corp has some payroll tax savings. Um, but, you know, but generally, S-Corps are not, not as good as LLCs anymore. Mm -hmm. So all right, good. You know, it really all depends. Now, one of the, these reorgs can also help you. If you've got two lines of business and you'd like to make one of them an S-Corp, you can spin it off. Let's say you have a C-Corp. You could split into two companies and then make an S selection for one of the companies or both the companies that you spun off. So you'll see that sometimes. Uh, let's say you have a company that maybe does like mining uh, and one that's just an operating business. So the mining business may own land and mineral rights that have gone, gone way up in value. If you converted from a C to an S in that case, you'd have a very large potential built-in gain tax, which is the way the IRS kind of gets you. Um, so you could spin off the operating business and then make an S selection for that business, which doesn't have the built-in gain problem. So that's... You know, that's probably the only area where we use the reorg to try to get an S selection going. All right, good. So as we come to a close, what, what else should I ask you that I haven't asked you? Uh, nothing, I, I don't think. But, I, you know, the only thing I would say in closing is that if one of if our someone in our you know, audience 
is having trouble with a partner or other shareholder, um, you know, there are options using this reorg, using one of these reorgs to kind of split the business amicably without tons of legal fees and fighting and destroying the business. Um, and also in a situation where you're looking to transfer the business, most usually in some type of family transaction to the next generation, and you have multiple lines of businesses and the next generation has different interests in the different lines, a reorg can be very, very helpful in that, in that area too. So I guess, you know, in closing, I would just say you're not necessarily trapped in whatever structure you currently have. And you need to talk to someone who's familiar with this. If you're in a situation where you feel like you need to do some type of restructuring, because maybe it's possible to do it on a tax-free basis. Yeah. Okay. So you did mention something right there at the end that um, provokes a question. Uh, someone who's experienced with this. Okay, so how can a listener know if their current advisor team, starting with their CPA, really, is experienced in this kind of work, and if they if they really know what they're doing, because it does take some you know specific specific knowledge. You've been doing this reorg kind of work for <laughs> you're an old guy, so a few <laughs> we both are a few, a few decades. Uh, so any, any uh, advice you can give them on kind of vetting their current CPA as to whether or not they really know what they're doing with this stuff? Yeah, so if they're working with a, a really large firm, CPA firm, someone in the firm is going to have the expertise. Sure. sure. Um, if they're working with a smaller firm, like you know, even our firm, you know, it's a 140-person firm. Um, so we have the expertise in-house, but only because I do the exit planning, do I do this on a regular basis in my CPA practice, mm -hmm. this does not come up very often. So mm -hmm. chances are any, any listener CPA is not going to be familiar with it. They're going to have to learn it. And you mm -hmm. generally don't want somebody learning it yeah. because number one, it might cost you more. And number two, they might, they might make a mistake. Yeah, it could cost you a whole lot if they get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, most, um, and, you know, if you have a CPA you love, it may just be a matter of hooking up, hooking them up with a tax attorney to make it work. Um, some CPAs, they don't mind someone else, another CPA firm coming in to work on a specific transaction. And it just depends on the relationship. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Um, okay, one, one last question. We got a minute or two. Uh, what's the biggest problem that you've seen in your many years of doing this kind of work for business owners? I mean, specifically in the reorg area? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think number one is they, they want to do what I described earlier that can't be done, which is they want to spin their company off and sell it right away. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, like, probably if I asked you the question about, you know, what, what do you see as the biggest problem? 90% of them come down to the client gets to us too late. They don't start early enough. At least 90%. Yeah. <laughs> so that's probably the biggest thing. Um, and this is a great example of you. You don't know what you don't know. You know, if you're a business owner and you're thinking about exiting and um, I just yeah. got an email from a gentleman this morning. Yeah, exactly. Who said, uh, reach out again in a, a year. I'm not ready yet, but I'm going to be ready in a year or something like that. Anyway, right. you know, you hear that a lot and, and they just don't know what they don't know. And this piece, just this piece that we've talked about here today is a great example of that and how, boy, if you, if you did know about it well in advance, it can make a huge difference from a tax perspective. And, that, and then hence, your net proceeds uh, from whatever kind of transaction you end up doing. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Walter. Been a great Come guest on. today. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> great content. Um, all right. And folks, thanks for listening. In our ne next episode, we're going to discuss lessons learned regarding sales to a third party from a business broker who's been 
doing business broker work for, for decades. And so that should be very interesting. Lessons learned, good, bad, and the ugly. So that'll, that'll be in two weeks. So look, look for that. And then um, if you want help in maximizing the value of business or planning your exit, you can reach uh, Walter at 301-951-9090. And you can reach me at 301-859-0860. You can also access uh, resources at exitreadiness.com, grfcpa.com, and nslp.com. And if you go to Exit Readiness and set up an account there and use the code podcast uh, when setting up your account, if you purchase something there, you can get a 10% pot list, listener discount, if you will. And... Um, Oh, and I'll mention to listener Suzanne. Suzanne, we're going to have an episode on planning for the surviving spouse. Not next episode, but the episode after that. So we're going to we're going to make that happen for you, uh, Suzanne. So, folks, thanks again. Until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast. This is Wal this is Pat and Walter Dial signing off. Thank you. Mm -hmm.